Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. IU Credit Union, now offering mobile access to IU Credit Union accounts, helping account holders check balances, transfer funds, and pay bills through their mobile devices. Available through the IU Credit Union apps for iPhone and Droid. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. Tonight, explore some of the most unique summertime activities across Indiana. Test your skills as an ancient warrior during the annual Spartan race. Train with Indiana's 49th Company F as they prepare for festival battles. Race down the country's longest track with the Indianapolis Soapbox Derby. And join your neighbors for a friendly game of wiffle ball. There's so much to do to take in that summer sun, so stay tuned to a new weekly special. Hello and welcome to the weekly special. I'm Erica Sagone. There are so many wonderful ways to enjoy Indiana, from festivals to recreation. Hoosiers are out and about taking in the summer sun. Or, if you'd like a bit more of a challenge, some summer mud in the annual Spartan race. Painful. A lot of barbed wire. That was pretty miserable. The mud right in the beginning kind of gets you. I fell face first in the first mud pit, so that didn't help. So then from then on, it was weighted shoes and mud and miserable cold. And a good time. <laughs> marathon or just running on a paved road is good if you're getting chased or you're running somewhere but it's kind of boring it's um doesn't feel great this is everybody's dream since they were a little kid whether it was to be a navy seal or be in the olympics or get out and be you know 007 here's your day to see what that feels like we are definitely a little crazy and sadistic and um we come up with things every day wouldn't it be great if we did this wouldn't that be cool? So 2004, we said, let's, let's start something that would change people's lives and, and would help us find people that would inspire us. Everybody has a 5K. There's one in every town, every city. Um, but this is a 5K through mud and hills and in water and over obstacles. It's getting back to the basics. Uh, we were made to run. We were made to go through the forest. Several hundreds of thousands of years ago, they did it already. So why not bring it back to that? Everybody, once they get that little taste of mud, they, they go after it full bore, so why not give them to Vienna? No matter where people are from, they want to do this. And uh, Indiana has been most interesting because we had no intention of coming to Indiana. We didn't think the population was here, we didn't think the demand was here. And the corn-fed group are a bunch of lunatics that demanded the Spartan race come to Indiana. And like I said, we said no. And they were relentless. They drove everybody in the organization crazy until we finally said yes. And, and you can see the result, it worked. They, they were right, we were wrong. We seen it as an obstacle. And if we fought hard enough, banged our head against that brick wall long enough, it was gonna come down, we were gonna get what we wanted. And we've got 3,500 people that showed up. We just signed up for the race, it'll be around 7,000 people throughout the day. So, it's pretty incredible, it's proud to see. Never done anything like this before. We've always just run regular races, and this was something out of our element. So we decided we would come down here and try something different and fun. Survival will be my approach. Following the people ahead of me and watching and seeing what they do, probably. That's it, keep going. Don't look at it, just jump right in, go for it. It's refreshing. Good for your skin. One of the members of our gym actually talked me into signing up for it when I did a weight loss challenge. 
so and that stupid me signed up, but I really liked it. Worst comes to worst, you get to see a lot of cool people having a great time. You get a little muddy, you get a little wet, and meet a lot of friends. Something you should definitely do once in your life. I came out here just to beat the hell out of myself for fun of it. And then say that you completed it and being able to tell your buddies at work that you did this, get on the internet and show them what you did. It's a total adrenaline rush. Confidence booster, actually. Most common reaction, hands down, is you changed my life. I mean, we hear it over and over and over every day. You've changed my life. I mean, I've had people that were drug addicts, that were overweight, that were chain smokers, and um, they come over and they hug me, and I, I don't even know them. It's just amazing. But it's not me. It's this whole movement that changed people. I mean, before I went out and did a marathon, I didn't think I could do it. And all you have to visualize is, God forbid, you were in a car accident, and you had to run 26 miles to get to safety. You would. You had to run 50 miles to get to safety, you would. So you can get out here and you can do this. It's just, it's gonna be a different mindset. You've gotta get toughen up, get off the couch and do it. And, and once you do, anything's possible. Spartan Warriors, they know no retreat, no surrender. Who am I? I am Spartan. Let's go. To find out how you can test your Spartan skills, visit their website, Spartan.com. The training isn't limited to just adventure races. For some, boot camp begins months earlier and is a lot more formal. Ready. Aim. Fire. Shoulder, arm. Quarter, arms. In place, rest. Nice job, guys. Nice job. I have a big desire to learn more about American history. I think I'm a little bit unique in the sense that I'm Latino. So I don't have any roots to the South or any roots to the North. It was purely a, a love of history that made me want to go out there and reach out there and, and learn more. And, and I think that's actually the greatest thing about this. You're, you're right in the middle of it. I can tell you what 400 guys in wet wool smells like. I can tell you what uh, cannon fire smells like. I've tasted black powder in my mouth by accident, of course. But, but uh, so, uh, you know, it, it gives you something more than just a textbook something you would learn more than just watching a movie or a documentary. So it, it really gives you a, a different flavor and a different take on it. So. The 49th Indiana really strives to be one of, the, one of the best drilled units in the Midwest. So we spend a lot of time drilling. We spend a lot of time doing particular drills that maybe are not done as frequently with other units. Uh, everything from skirmish drill to bayonet drill. We've found that uh, that not only helps attract people to join our group, but also it's helpful in instructing the public about that period of time because it seems to attract uh, the public when we go out. Once I saw this, I became interested. It almost becomes like an addiction. Uh, you see it, you try it, guys start doing some different things, and you want to belong. You want to participate, so you're willing to take those extra steps to do something a little bit different or to try something. And I, I, I detest these shoes. I absolutely hate them. They feel awful, but I'm wearing them, right? And you're going to have to if you want to go out here in March. But because I, I want to be part of the group, I want to, I want to share, I want to teach, and I want to learn. I want to see how sore those soldiers' feet were. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to put these shoes on. So I don't think it's something that you make a, a note of and you say, I'm going, to, I'm going to really try this. You just start to become absorbed in it. And before you, you know it, you, you got a couple different jackets and several different types of pants. And, you know, you, you're, uh, you're willing to do whatever everybody else is doing as well. So. What you're out there in the field and what we're doing there is just a small part. We're actually firing and showing a battle's probably 30 minutes at, at best in some instances but the rest of the weekend in the reenactment is camp life. And when people come to see us, they're expecting to step back in time, to step back to 1862. So we have to know what, what's, what are the what politics, what's the land, what's the popular literature, what's going on in the war, why are we fighting the war, uh, what, what are the events that are going, what, what do people eat? So your, your research, you have to get away from the, the, the 20th century, the 21st century, things that we're all used to and put yourself back 150 years ago. All of the folks that are in our group still have a tremendous amount of passion for American history and, and I think almost uh, to the person, every single person in the unit 
uh, it has a little bit of a teacher inside them and they like going out and being able to instruct and educate folks about that period of history and I think when we do that that's really what drives our passion to be as accurate as possible because we want to make sure that we are we're communicating and educating and, and teaching how it really was back then in that time. There are some people that are really truly here because they feel like they're able to teach history and I certainly see that that now to put your hat on a kid to let him hold your gun, put your jacket on him. The, the feeling, the, the look in his eyes, the way they light up uh, is just tremendous. And so I, I never expected to get that joy out of being able to share and to teach. Uh, but that, that's the part that I think is the most surprising. Kids are so into that. They go home and they look at these things and it gets them interested in history. And it just creates that spark in them. And they want to study history then. And it's just a really neat thing seeing that in a kid. You get them hooked on that stuff. And it's just a really neat experience to do that. The Civil War, I think, is so romanticized, right? We talk about the legends and the history and, and, uh, and the stories, really. In some of these events that we go to, some of the larger ones, you get a, a real sense, a real feeling of how many people are out there. And then to think, how many of these people, had this been the war for real, how many people would be lying dead on the ground? And, and I think it does start to pierce you a little bit. You start to get a better sense of what they could have felt or, 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 or what they could have seen and how they would have felt. My very first reenactment experience, um, I, I remember looking out and, and seeing a bunch of guys and their rifles are pointed right at you. Now, of course, the, it, they're blanks, but just the fact that those guns are pointed right at you, 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 get a, you get a certain, you become jittery a little bit. And so, again, it, it doesn't quite take you there, but you certainly now start feeling more that emotion you, and you start feeling just a little bit more connected to what that soldier may have felt. When it comes to the history, you don't want to dishonor the people you're reenacting. And you know, that's very important to us. Most of us have ancestors that fought in the Civil War. And you feel a strong tie. You can't help but feel a bond with those men. We're not just a bunch of grunts out there throwing around bayonets. There's such another human side to that. There's so much more to these people that people don't see, and I wish they could see that. I wish more people would come out and talk to us and experience what we are. That's the neatest way to learn about history is to go out and live it. It was a defining moment for the country, and, and we want to make sure that we honor that. It's not just out here to, to shoot guns and make noise. It's, it's to pay respect to those who served, those who've fallen, and keep their memories alive for the great deeds that they've done. To see the 49th Indiana Infantry in action, visit their website, 49thindiana.com, for the latest schedule of events. Indiana is known for its great traditions, from reenactments to races, and the Indianapolis 500 isn't the only famous race in town. The winning lane is one, with a time of zero point zero. The Soapbox Derby was started in the 30s. But what's important about Indianapolis is that we've had a race every year that there's been a soapbox derby race, we have had a race without interruption. And Indianapolis is only one of three cities that have their own dedicated track. The sport was very, very popular until the early 70s. And since then, the Indianapolis and the All-American Soapbox Derby all over the United States has sort of struggled financially. But even though that has been a problem, there's still people that just keep coming back and keep coming back. And I meet people who their parents were in it. It's a family sport. The whole family gets involved in it. And that's what's a great part. And the kids learn so much. You don't drop them off and then come back and pick them up. You have to be there participating. They're not only involved just for them individually, but they're involved with their brothers, their sisters, Cleo had five kids racing. Five. Now he is, he is family, <laughs> plural. <laughs> but to me, my family's always been close. So this is the way we come out on the weekend and be close together. And so that's why we try to get more families involved in it. I was looking for something to do with my oldest son. He wasn't into baseball and football and that, but I wanted to do something with him. And so that's how we got into this. And then all my kids, and my grandkids have been in it. My granddaughter is racing today for her first time to race. We've been practicing this last month. We got her car ready and she's a little nervous. So when she comes down the hill, 
be careful. You don't know where she's going. <laughs> That's how you learn. Yeah. Yeah. My grandpa built the car, and my I, my dad helped me pick the stickers. I really don't like waking up early, but my favorite part of racing is going fast. The kids learn so much. They learn about relationships. We have such a diversified group of people that race here. They learn teamwork. teamwork. That's, that's the most important thing out here, teamwork. All the kids work together. From listening to the parents and, and what we have to figure out, making sure everything in the car is aligned and adjusted just perfect. They get to be very detail-oriented. Kids learn about the cars, how to get the cars fine-tuned in. I joined Debbie Racing because they came to my school and advertised it, so I joined to see what it was about, and it was fun, and I liked it. My mom helps me build my car. The best part about racing is just winning and having fun. It's, it's beneficial to our family because it brings us together. It's a, it's a common goal, even during the week, where the kids, they'll be thinking about what can make the car go faster, you know. When you're home, you're thinking derby all the time. All the time. Like. We constantly think of derby. <laughs> Keep the family together. That's all they do is here. When you come out here, family stays together. To learn how you can become involved or to find the latest race schedule, visit IndianapolisSoapboxDerby.com. And just like the Soapbox Derby, there are so many nostalgic summertime events. And what Hoosier doesn't remember? A friendly game of pickup ball. We all played on travel baseball teams together and since nine, 10 years old. And we'd get done with tournaments. Maybe we lost a tournament early on a weekend or something. We'd come out here and we want to play more, man. I'm, I'm tired of losing. At first, I built a baseball field. And as you can see behind me, there's just not enough room for a baseball field. So it ended up just being kind of a makeshift rope across the yard and a hundred foot fence. And we just hit into the trees out there. And I was like, this isn't working. I think I just stumbled across it on YouTube and I was like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen because this guy built a wiffle ball field out in his front yard and I found some like national wiffle ball pages and everything and found that this is actually a pretty big sport and that I'd like to do it myself. We got out here with the tractor and tilled it all up and made a nice wiffle ball field out of it. It's been kind of evolving ever since. When I tell people that I have a wiffle ball league, I don't think they take me seriously and so I have to kind of nudge them to get out here, I'm like, no, seriously, come over this weekend, let's play some wiffle ball. And they get out of here and they start walking up and their jaw kind of drops. We've always talked about this with me and my friends, like when you come out here, you're not expecting much. You think, oh, it's wiffle ball, like you're gonna go play in a field, that's kind of dumb. But then when you go out and see it, it's like, man, this is really cool. So when he had some weekend tournaments that were just for fun a couple summers ago, he kind of got me hooked. I told him, and he joked me, it's, it's super American, I mean, just like, wiffle ball in the backyard like on a Friday night and you know cook out and food and everything it's just it's a, it's a really cool thing to do in the summer wiffle ball has actually picked up a lot of speed nationwide basically all the Midwest up into the Northeast is where a lot of the teams are and I think there's somewhere around 75 leagues registered when I first told them that I wanted to start the league they were all for it honestly because we've been playing a little bit and we really wanted to make it more official and start keeping stats and maybe get a couple teams ranked in the national rankings, so that's what we did. And we looked up how to throw wiffle ball pitches, we looked up batting techniques, and we just came out here. And The most surprising thing about when we started playing wiffle ball was the fact that the ball moves like 10 feet at times, and you're trying to hit it with this little inch round stick, and it's a lot harder than it looks. It's a lot harder than baseball at some points. This is our first regular season. We have four teams, four players on each team, and three guys play the field, all four can bat. To have a really good wiffle ball league, it takes great leadership. The, I think maybe even more importantly are the players in it and how into it and serious they are about it because the more into it and passionate they get about it, the more fun it gets. It's almost like a, a little professional league out here, and that's the best part about it. We get into it, we get in arguments about it, we'll talk about it when we're not playing wiffle ball, we'll talk about our stats, so we're definitely very serious about it. I mean, obviously we're not the Major League Baseball, we know that, 
but like the scores of our games are really comparable and the strike zone's very realistic. Some of the talented players we have out here, the pitching's pretty real. But it was just cool, like you hit a walk-off homer and they line up at home plate, like just going crazy and stuff. It makes you feel like you're in the pro game. It, it's a different sport, it's easy to pick up and do. And any guy can come out here and hit a home run, run the bases with his fist in the air and just feel like he's on top of the world. It's just so satisfying to see something you create that was so small that kind of is growing now. I want this league to grow into something that kind of gets everyone together into like a big Sandlot because Sandlot was my favorite movie and I just want a nice community. I want tight knit people and just come out here and, and really be close with each other and have a great time playing wiffle ball. To join yourself or cheer on a hometown favorite, visit the National Wiffle League Association page to find a team in your area. With all these activities and events to see across the state, road trips are a must. And if you're going to travel, you might as well travel in style. My name is Dan Piper. Uh, I own Vintage Campers, uh, Peru, Indiana. <laughs> Vintage Campers is an actual outgrowth of my passion. When I got where I could camp on my own, the only thing I could afford was an old camper. And so I camped with an old camper, restored it myself, and had a lot of fun with it. I actually thought I was the only person in the world who was an old trailer nut. And then about 17 years ago, I was out camping in my 1960 Shasta, and I got talking with a fellow camper about the old trailers. I found that there was other old trailer nuts out there, and so I got really excited about it. So I just started buying and selling a few of the vintage campers on my website. After doing that for about seven years, I found that the vintage campers is where my true passion was. And we've been dealing in the vintage camper since then, and then have just continued to grow in, from selling them to um, restoring them and selling parts for them and just doing a, a full service vintage camper operation. As far as the Midwest, we're probably the only one I can think of that actually does the full service. We specialize in 60s and older. We try to deal in the trailers that employ riveted construction. So basically they're built like an airplane. They have aluminum skin on the outside. That aluminum skin is riveted to studs inside the walls, which are typically aluminum. So the main three that we carry as far as the riveted trailers would be Spartan, Airstream, and Avion but there's lots of other trailers that we would carry. Curtis Wright, Silver Streak, Streamline, Bowls Arrow, Westcraft. There's, there's actually a bunch of them out there. They're not, not near as common as the, the Airstream or the Avion or the Spartan, but um, still very cool trailers. It doesn't really matter if it's the RV industry, the boat industry, the house industry. Things were just built better back then. Um, people took uh, pride in their workmanship. If you look at the name tags on these old campers, it's not a little plastic sticker or a little vinyl label that says their name. It's usually a metal decal that they put some, some money into because they were proud of it. The older they are, the more uh, wear and tear, more abuse they've had, so the more work involved. But um, the older ones, there's just not as many out there. So, so finding a, a good old one is a, a good find. My own personal preference is the older the better. <laughs> As far as restoration, our preference is to restore trailers back pretty much to how they were when they were rolled out of the assembly line in the factory. One of the biggest problems we run into is water damage. So a lot of the expensive work on a restoration is uh, replacing the woodwork in the trailers. We'll upgrade them electrically. Uh, the plumbing, we usually just go ahead and replace the plumbing. And then all the cosmetic stuff, the light fixtures, the, uh, the hardware and so forth. Um, we like to, a lot of times those pieces are missing, so we will, you know, salvage old trailers and, and rescue the old parts and pieces that we can use if that trailer is too far gone to restore. It will pretty much do anything to them. The only thing we won't do is, is someone ask us to totally butcher and chop up a nice good unit, we'll say no thanks. <laughs> Since vintage campers are my passion, um, I would love to keep them all, but uh, unfortunately I can't do that because of the economics. And so I do have what I call my keepers. I would, like I say, n like to not sell any of them. My line now is I sell vintage campers to support my habit of keeping them. 
and that's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> The vintage camper culture is, is definitely growing. I think a lot of the baby boomers like myself grew up camping, had a good time, fun time, and they want to sort of bring back their childhood memories. Well, we hope you've enjoyed a look at the best in Indiana recreation. Get out there and have some fun. Thanks again and good night. Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. IU Credit Union, now offering mobile access to IU Credit Union accounts, helping account holders check balances, transfer funds, and pay bills through their mobile devices. Available through the IU Credit Union apps for iPhone and Droid. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you.